thank you. Um, I know these stories can get a bit heavy, and I'm sorry about that. Because of our story, which I'm here to tell, um, we have been contacted by other people, and the, the crux of our story has been going for about four years now. Um, but if you really want to spend time watching YouTubes, you find these stories of real Australians that have been put on by guys like this down here that have asked questions and you find those YouTubes and you, you listen, there's there are, these types of stories are all around this country and I do believe they're all around the Western world as somebody said earlier. We immigrated from the United States to Western Australia after purchasing land in 2001 for the sole purpose of building a beef cattle feedlot south of the regional town of Narragin, two and a quarter hours inland from Perth. We came with our own life savings in search of golden soil and wealth for toil. And we found it in spades. There was an opportunity in the wheat belt of Western Australia and we came to live. We and our four young children, three of whom were born in the Narragin Hospital, are now Australian citizens. We took much care and spent significant time in developing the site-specific feedlot project from an environmental, an animal welfare, and a financial perspective. Upon submitting the detailed plans to the relevant authorities, we were on hold over a year getting approvals. We were finally granted permission to construct a 15,000 head feedlot on the site we proposed. A small group of people opposed our development from the beginning and two appeals were lodged against our original works approval. There is a 12,000 head piggery directly adjacent to our property which had been there for 20 years and about which this same group had complained bitterly prior to our purchase. The first post went into the ground of February 2003 and the first cattle went on feed in June of that year. Complaints, usually based on odour, against our facility were made almost from the beginning. As president of the WA Lot Feeders Association, Matt attended a meeting in May of 2007 between environmental departments, environmental groups and industry to discuss transitioning the National Pollutant Inventory, or NPI, system to the National Environmental Protection Measures, or NEPM, system and including so-called greenhouse gas emissions in the required reporting regime. At this meeting, Matt questioned the number that members of the feedlotting industry were forced to use in our calculation of pollution under NPI. In our case, it was ammonia. The figures supplied to our industry for calculations and reporting were physiologically impossible. It meant that our cattle were emitting more nitrogen than they were taking in. The officials could give no answer. Then Matt proposed to include to oppose inclusion of greenhouse gases in the new reporting, stating that in his opinion, they did not meet the definition of pollution. The industry people at the meeting were very interested in what Matt had to say and gathered around him to take copies of the great global warming swindle DVD and Lavoisier group material that he handed out. Soon after this, the Department of Environment and Conservation appeared to increase their reliance upon complaints against our business and correspondence with DEC increased dramatically. Also after the May meeting, the Environmental Defenders Office, or EDO, a state and federally funded not-for-profit organization, got involved with a small group of local complainants. The handful of complainants incorporated into the Narragin Environmental Action Team and they learned how to, in general, gum up the work so that our project would die on the vine before coming to fruition. At this point, we had built a 10,000 head of our approved 15,000 head development. DEC's actions worried us enough to cause us to stop further investment. The vast majority of local people are highly supportive or at least ambivalent about our business being in Narragin. There is a high degree of attention given our development, but mostly from people that are interested in economic activity and ensuring that our community grows and thrives with real productive businesses being a base for local sustainability. 
In early 2008, we hired attorneys in Perth because it had become apparent that a positive outcome was not going to be forthcoming with the Department of Environment. After getting up to speed on our case, the solicitor and barrister suggested that we meet with Dr. Johanna Schumbe, an environmental attorney. After some resistance, we agreed to meet him. He basically suggested that we crawl on hands and knees back to the DEC, admit we were wrong, and hire him, and he would fix all of our problems. By the way, he was in the same building as DEC on St. George's Terrace in Perth. Since we had not done anything wrong and because we could not afford to pay him on an ongoing basis, after meeting with him for 40 minutes, we declined his further involvement. His bill was $4,000. In 2009, we discovered that Dr. Johanna Schumbe was the convener of EDO, the Environmental Defender's Office. He had never disclosed or even attempted to allude to any such connection. In the license issued to us on the 31st of March 2008, DEC limited our throughput to 6,000 head, effectively half of our built-up capital infrastructure. They did so knowing full well that such a limit would cause our financial demise as we could not cash flow the investment of such a restriction. During the 18 months it took for our appeal to be heard, decided upon, and implemented, our business, which had proven very viable, was ruined. By the time the clarification on our amended license was received, there were only six months remaining on the original two-year license. Our existing bank was not willing to provide additional funding, no bank was willing to refinance us, and no purchaser was forthcoming at the auction held on the 20th of October 2009 because of the lack of certainty hanging over the license. At one point when we were operating at 10,000 head and constructing in-house, we had over 20 full-time equivalent employees. Throughout the last year, we had managed to hold on to eight of our core group of excellent employees with the intention of building up our business again once a common sense outcome was achieved with the DEC. We were forced to lay off these employees in November 2009. We trucked the last of the cattle one month later. After working actively with and encouraging DEC to take action on a new license from October, DEC finally delivered our new license on the 8th of March 2010, knowing that our bank had given us until the 15th of March to give them a solution. The new license was untenable and the appeal ruling did not deliver any relief. Our operations manager and close personal friend, Lindley Bosley, committed suicide that month. He was, a, he was well aware of the latest developments. He had taken casual employment since we laid him off with the idea that he would come back to us when possible. Lindley was a doer, a problem solver, one of those guys that could turn his hand to anything with a smile. He also proved himself to be an amazing people manager, which is very rare, and he knew more about our place than we did. While depression is an elusive animal, and we can never know everything that was going on inside of him, we know that Lindley felt frustrated that he could not solve the problem. He was depressed seeing all he had engineered and helped to build, sitting idle. Despair is a terrible thing. I understand it. It's depressing to have bureaucrats telling us what we can and cannot do when they have never produced anything in this world except more red tape. In attempting to justify their jobs, they keep a good man like Lindley from helping to feed the world. The value in Lindley at every level was too great to quantify. We feel a deep, dark hole in our hearts and minds at the injustice of this situation. We feel compelled to get involved to ensure that this does not happen again, and we will do what we must. Above all, though, we want to produce. That's all we ever wanted to do. Produce. Make things. Be productive. When we're not allowed to do the only thing we've ever wanted to do, 
when good problem-solving men like Lindley Bosley are driven to despair because the non-producers triumph over the producers, then we must act. We owe millions of dollars. With a license, our feedlot has value that would pay back those creditors. Without a reasonable license, there is no value. The National Australia Bank appointed receivers in September 2010. We filed a case against the DEC in federal court in October. We're hoping that in the interest of our creditors, NAB and the other very good people who trusted us enough to do business with us, the receivers will allow us to pursue the case before moving in and liquidating assets. The challenge we all face, producers, consumers, elected representatives, is vast. Environmental extremists have infiltrated many good organizations and our system of governance, which relied upon people's goodness, has been bastardized and taken advantage of. Regulations and policies have advanced without the benefit of a vote and the bureaucracy is beginning to strangle everything in its path. In a developed society, land use conflict will always exist. Much of the conflict today is being created by governments though attempting to manage land belonging to other people. We found out only recently about the so-called conservation corridors in Western Australia and the plan put forward by DEC in 2006 called a 100-year biodiversity conservation strategy for Western Australia. We fear there is a lack of a true understanding of eco economics and the relationships between progress and the environment. The emotion driving movements such as the biodiversity agenda has led to decisions being made that will have severe detrimental effects on our state and our country in future. We believe decisions about our own situation have been tainted by many of these emotive movements. There are many decent people who have been involved with the formerly good organizations who do not recognize what has been happening and they're unwittingly promoting an extremist agenda. It is vital that you and other good people see the very real and horrific results of that agenda. That's why we're here. Thank you.